usually takes a moment. It's just loading up. All right. Um, we're really, really excited to uh, be hosting another conversation uh, on the union-based platform. Uh, I know I always, always say this, but you know, today we have a really special guest. I really mean that. Um, this uh, joining us today is the Honorable Mark Pierce, and I'm going to tell you um, some things about uh, Mr. Pierce and you know the type of work he's been doing and some of the extraordinary uh, accomplishments he's made in his life. Um, first, I just wanna give a little context uh, for the moment that we're in. I think that's always helpful. Um, you know, we started doing these broadcasts uh, around March, uh, 2020. So uh, near the beginning of what we know as the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously we have no idea how long uh, the virus had been going around the world. Um, some people say, you know, late 2019. Um, but we, we started these broadcasts as a way to discuss what's happening uh, with workers, what's happening with contingent workers like Uber and Lyft, um, you know, frontline workers, people are delivering food, um, but also what's happening with uh, traditional union workers and union staff. What are the challenges that they're facing um, while the pandemic is wreaking havoc on our health, our livelihoods, um, and our communities? So far, we've gotten really amazing feedback. Um, a lot of you have joined us multiple times. We've had really great guests to join us. Fela Townsend from Rutgers, um, Bill Fletcher, um, legendary labor leader, and many others. Uh, Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. Um, you know, just really, really excited. And I want to, you know, take a second to just acknowledge a lot of you who have RSVP for this conversation. We have something around uh, 300 RSVPs this, this time, which is amazing for Tuesday at like 2.30 Eastern. Um, and then a lot of you will be joining us as uh, we distribute the video um, later on. Um, I want to just encourage you to do a couple things before I share, you know, who's RSVP. One, uh, feel free to join unionbase.org. You can follow up on, you know, what's happening um, on our platform when we have more discussions like this and also um, just kind of see what we're trying to do to upgrade the tech uh, of the labor movement. This is something we've been working on for a while. The second thing you can do is, uh, you know, subscribe to us on YouTube. I know it sucks to have, you know, advertisement, but like the only way you're going to know when we have these discussions consistently is if you hit the subscribe button. So please do that. All right. So Let's take a look at who has RSVP. You know, we have, I'm really proud to see we have someone from PWU, Progressive Workers Union. I was um, one of the first presidents of PWU. Um, AFSCME, Council 36, Cleveland, Jobs with Justice, OPIU, 1794. We got uh, Teamsters, I think someone from the International, welcome. Uh, AFGE, which is Federal Government Employees, um, Unite Here, Massachusetts Nurses Association, California School Employees Association, um, someone formerly represented by UAW, IBT, SCIU, AFSCME, Operating Engineers, and the Michigan State Troopers Association. Wow. Uh, we have some people who say they're in too many organizations to list. Uh, we have AFGE, uh, UFCW 400, that, that AFGE local 727. We have North Suburban Teachers Union, New Haven People Center, National Lawyers Guild, Labor and Employment Committee. Love you guys. AFT Local 1931. Uh, we have a member of PMWG. They're also a member of TNG and CWA. Uh, we have a, another AFGE person, someone from the AFL-CIO, Local 2923. Uh, GEO UIUC, uh, which is University of Illinois Urbana uh, Campaign or Champagne, pardon me. We have someone from CBTU, Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. Welcome, love you guys. Um, California State Union Employees Union, uh, University Employees Union, pardon me, UAW Local 7, uh, AFT Staff Union, uh, UTLA, um, and Spokane Regional Labor Council, Faith Coalition for the Common Good, Iowa Federation of Labor, the National Association of Government Employees and slash IAEP. Uh, we have the Machinists, so the IAM, uh, District W24, welcome. 
uh, the LA Orange County's building construction trades. Wow, great to see you guys. Um, someone who's a member, not representing, but a member of AFT, AAUP, and AFM, welcome. Uh, a lot of Teamsters on here, a lot of PW. Uh, NYSUT is joining us. I uh, love to see you guys. And still workers, 10670 local. And Layuna, welcome, awesome. Solidarity Info Science, retired uh, organizer and labor educator, welcome. Some more PW, some more UAW. ESC Local 20, AFSME 3299, TWU, NWI Resist, uh, retired labor educator. I'm, I'm just really actually blown away reading this list because I've never done this on air before, but when you see how many people are actually participating, it's just like, it's fantastic. And these are people from all over the country, lots of Cornell people, um, OPIU 251, Iowa State Education Association, California Faculty Association, International Cin Cinematographers Guild. One more thing that's occurring to me as I'm reading this is like our, our movement is huge and we have a lot of people in a lot of places. And so we should talk more about this at some point. I'm gonna get through this so we can get to our discussion with Mr. Pierce, but um, LA uh, Orange County's Building Construction Trade uh, Council, um, the ETFO, uh, IBEW, Electrical Workers Union, um, which is awesome. International Union of Operating Engineers, we mentioned them. Roofers 36, Portland Community College, Federation of Faculty and Academic Professionals. There's a lot of people here who haven't necessarily identified the organization. So if we're not mentioning you, please pardon me. Um, we got the Solidarity Center. I mean, to be honest with you, there's too many organizations for me to read because we'll be doing this for an hour. But I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for the support that you all have given us um, both online in person, the letters you've written, the subscriptions to Workplace Leader, all the support in 2020 has kept our organization alive and growing. And as you know, we do this because we wanna strengthen the labor movement, traditional labor, and also workers who are not able to join a union and help them to have a path to organizing themselves. Okay, so with all that said, um, I'm gonna probably follow up to all of you guys with just a specific thank you letter and then think of ways that we can work together more in 2021. So without further ado, I want to introduce our esteemed guest, uh, the Honorable Mark Gaston Pierce. I want to tell you a little bit about him. Um, I, I couldn't possibly summarize this in a couple of sentences, so forgive me for just like going in a little bit here. Uh, Mark Gaston Pierce is executive director of the Workers' Rights Institute at Georgetown University Law Center. Mr. Pierce is a former board member and chairman of the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, who served for two terms, concluding in August 2018. That's a big deal, y'all. Prior to assuming his position at Georgetown, he was visiting senior scholar and lecturer at Cornell University's School of Industrial Labor Relations. Uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Mr. Pierce is a graduate of Cornell University and State University of New York at Buffalo Law School. He was a founding partner at Creighton Pierce, Johnson and Geertz and began his 40 year career first as a field attorney and later district trial specialist with region, region three of the National Labor Relations Board. After entering private practice, Mr. Pierce served as by appointment of governor of New York State to the NYS Industrial Board of Appeals, as well as several state committees and commissions. He is currently arbitrator and also served as a certified mediator for the United States District Court, Western District of New York. Mr. Pierce is a fellow of the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers and has lectured and given continuing legal education presentations before state and national bar associations labor management organizations and educational institutions throughout the country. There's so much more to be said about Mr. Pierce, but I just wanna just say welcome. And, you know, I'm really happy to have you as part of this conversation. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Larry. And thank you for having me. And greetings to everybody. That list is a phenomenal list of people who are tuning in. I am totally impressed and totally honored for the opportunity to share an hour with everybody. Yeah, well, part of the draw to these conversations is the guests, right? I mean, people have seen me talk a million times, so it's not like a big thing. But when I'm able to get people like yourself, uh, you know, like Fareed from CBTU, like Bill Fletcher, I think people know that you all have dedicated your life to this work. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to have a person, um, you know, stating their opinion, but I think a lot of your experiences are really gonna uh, bring some light to these subjects. So why don't we jump right in? Um, so 
you know, contextually, you know, President elect uh, Biden has started assembling his team, uh, his COVID response team. Also, importantly, his economic advisors, you know, people who are going to be guiding him in the policy. Um, you are you know, served as a really high member of the National Labor Relations Board, in addition to other work that, you know, while, while I work, I was working in unions at the time. I wasn't a president at that time, but I was working in unions, so I knew about your work. I was very um, excited to have you there. I think uh, folks have not really been too aware that Pre uh, President -elect Biden assembled labor leaders as well as uh, business leaders for a discussion about uh, you know the the new economy, right? Uh, what to, what to do for workers. He also had a discussion with frontline workers. Um, so Google this if you can. Um, you know where he was talking to you know, about about unions and workers directly, and we haven't seen that from a president in a very very long time. Um, but all that leads me to ask you, uh, Mr. Pierce. What should unions and non-union workers expect from the National Labor Relations Board in the Biden era? Um, and you know, how does that relate to the history of how the NLRB was created? Well, thanks for that question, Larry. And if I could, I'd like to go back and start giving a little bit of perspective on how the National Labor Relations Act was created and what precipitated it. Um, as I've said on several occasions when I've spoken about this subject, the United States is unique in that the, the National Labor Relations Act was born out of conflict. Um, uh, one would view labor management relations as an effort towards harmonizing and win-win. But what we had here was an atmosphere that was fairly caustic, fairly violent, and the National Labor Relations Act was developed in order to protect and preserve uh, workers from the, the challenges and the, the, the violence that in, and the economic depravity that, that ensued because of this conflict. Now, um, the period of time where the National Labor Relations Act came about was, was the 30s, 29, 30s, during the Depression. Um, uh, it's, it's funny, the, uh, there is an adage or a saying actually attributed to, to uh, uh, Mark Twain that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Mm -hmm. um, and what we had during that time period was um, uh, stock market crashes, uh, banks uh, uh, recalling loans, credit was gone, businesses had to re renege on benefits, pension plans and layoffs of employees. Unemployment was up to 35%. And while all this was going on, there was a national, a natural disaster going on, the Dust Bowl. It wasn't really a natural disaster because it was uh, mankind interfering with, with nature and uh, messing with terrain that it shouldn't have messed with, which created this big dust cloud that, that devastated a substantial portion of the United States. So all this was going on at the same time. Herbert Hoover was president. His solution was a Darwinian one, basically, you know, tighten our belts, liquidate labor, stocks, farms, purge all that is rotten and start anew. People will work harder and live a more moral life. Uh, well, that exactly didn't work out too well. And, and in fact, um, it was uh, so unpopular that there you saw a difference between what we have been experiencing now. And that is the Republicans in Hoover's own party uh, didn't think Hoover, Hoover's solution made sense. So two Republicans, uh, George Norris and Fioretta, Fioretta LaGuardia came up with a bill that became the Norris LaGuardia Act. The Norris LaGuardia Act pre preceded the National Labor Relations Act and provided some essential things. No yellow dog contracts. Those are contracts where, where an employer will require an employee to sign 
saying that they would not join a union if they worked there. Um, in fact, we heard about yellow dog contracts during Ruth Bader Ginsburg's dissent in the Epic Systems case, which of course was a devastating case that I could get into later. Um, and it also, it also provided that there would be a freedom for unions and employees to engage in collective action, so like striking, without being enjoined by the courts. And there would be no individual liability because they engaged in this protected concerted activity. Uh, America was totally fed up with, with Hoover at the time that, that, that FDR was elected. So he won by a landslide. Uh, with a, within a hundred days of his being elected, um, FDR put together a National Industrial Re Recovery Act, which was another predecessor component th uh, to the National Labor Relations Act. This was an interesting one because the government relaxed antitrust laws and made it a deal with business. Business would be able to essentially price fix in exchange for guaranteeing certain minimums in wages for em employees and that the employees would also have the right to organize and bargain collectively. Now, the only problem with this was they didn't build in that legislation a means of keeping everything calm. So what happens is employees unionize and employers responded by not engaging with them for collective bargaining. So there was a lot of strikes. So the strike activity heightened and so did the violence. There were Pinkertons and, and strike breakers and so forth that, that created a lot of violence and a lot of uh, labor unrest and uh, labor, labor strife. So much so that things needed to be done in order to adjust that. Well, the Supreme Court kind of took, took it in their hands in that they determined that this National Industrial Re Recovery Act was unconstitutional, primarily because of this deal to, um, to provide uh, uh, price fixing. This it was an antitrust violation and so forth. So that was, that was thrown out. But on the, on the heels of that, there was a blue wave in Congress. Democrats went in uh, heavily. Uh, uh, FDR uh, got his boy, Robert Wagner, to put together what is now known as the Wagner Act, the central component of the National Labor Relations Act. Now, now the Wagner Act provided in its preamble that law recognizes the inequality of bargaining power cause, which causes wages to be depressed. They recognize that corporations are unionized in that they have their own organizations. They have, there's the Chamber of Commerce, there are the National Association of Manufacturers, there's ABC, the uh, American um, um, uh, uh, well, the Contractors Association, I'm remember, forget, forgetting the nomen nomenclature. And labor didn't have the comparable uh, organization that, that, bu that business had, and there was a desire to try to level the playing field. The preamble of the National Labor Relations Act interestingly states that because management refuses to collectively bargain and provide uh, uh, um, an ability to engage in uh, protected concerted activity and collective bargaining, that that conflict was at the core of labor un unrest and there was a means to cure that. And that means would be encouraging collective bargaining through the National Labor Relations Act. That was the charge given to the, to the National Labor Relations Board at its outset. Um, and, and it went forward. So that means 
Section seven still existed. And section seven says, you have a right to organize, you have a right to engage in protected concerted activity for mutual aid or protection. Okay, go forth. But at the same time, you can't uh, engage, you have to bargain, you can't engage in wildcat strikes, et cetera. Uh, Taft Hartley in 1947 was, then came later and it put a clamp down on a lot of the, the power and the abilities that, that unions had to, had to organize. First of all, the National Labor Relations Board, which started out as three, three people, became a five member board. So consequently, a majority changed from two, a two person majority to a three person majority. So if you have a progressive board, you, you, in, in order to get things done, three people would have to sign on. Uh, the general counsel, who is usually under the board, and in most jurisdictions, the general counsel um, sh is subordinate to the board and is the lawyer of, of the agency. Here, the general counsel became an independent, independent of the five member board and was separately appointed by the president and, and um, with the advice and consent of the Senate. Uh, what else did the, the, the Taft-Hartley do? It, it, it gave people the right to refrain from engaging in union activities. Um, it gave employers free speech, a free speech clause for employers. So think about this, Larry. You got a, a, uh, an act that was devised to facilitate and to encourage collective bargaining. And then in 1947, the act was amended to allow employers to express views, arguments, or opinions against unionization as long as there was no threat attached to it. So that's not exactly encouraging collective bargaining, but that's, that's how the, 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 the development of labor law has been in this country giveth and taketh away, um, uh, providing a strong right, but that, that right is completely eliminated by either interpretation of the law or another statute that discounts it. Um, Mr. Pierce, I, I think that that was all, you know, extremely relevant to this conversation because, you know, a lot of times when we talk about what we want to accomplish as unions, as worker centers, as, you know, whatever, you know, group of independent workers, uh, you know, under a new administration, but oftentimes we're restricted by labor law that's super outdated and super restrictive. So given that history of, you know, uh, you know, law being used to, you know, settle down tensions and bring people to the table and then to restrict workers' rights, you know, what can we reasonably accomplish as a labor movement, you know, understanding that that term has different meanings to different people, um, and also, you know, what can, you know, um, President-elect Biden hope to actually accomplish over the next four to possibly eight years on behalf of workers? Well, the, the first piece of your question, um, I view as an understanding that, that workers have to have as to what their rights are. Um, the National Labor Relations Act was this behemoth that came out of, out of an assembly line designed to do great things and to do great reform. But the act was, was equipped with an underpowered engine and only three wheels. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a ability to do anything was hampered substantially just by the way it was structured. And what, do I, what am I talking about? We're talking about a, a, an, an act that the, the orders that they issue are not self-enforcing. In order for their orders to, to have any kind of meaning, they have to go to federal court to get it, to get it enforced. There's no private right to action. There, there is no punitive damages. Um, uh, and uh, there is no ability for the NLRB to initiate investigations. Anything that occurs based on uh, the, the, any violation of the law stems from a complaint that gets filed with the NLRB and the NLRB has to investigate it. If workers don't understand 
the law or don't know what their rights are, they can't go in and file a charge with the board to, to investigate because they don't know what, what they need to do. Um, the National Labor Relations Board does not provide a obvious means of pre presenting the employees their rights so that employees would know. Um, at one time when union density was stronger, it was the unions that, 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 that um, educated employees as to what their rights are. Um, the, with the unions diminishing and, and those kind of instructions are not provided in the schools, employees are left to have to figure out for themselves what their rights are. That's part of the reason why I was excited about uh, starting this Workers' Rights Institute because we hope that this institute would be a vehicle for more worker education. The labor laws are woefully inadequate. However, those labor laws do have certain protections that are provided to employees, but employees, the workers need to know what they are. Now, what can the uh, uh, Biden administration do initially? Now, in the first hundred days, a president did amazing things when you looked at what FDR did, but FDR had a backdrop that was significantly uh, different than what we have now. What, what we have now is, is a, with changes in the law, the ability of, of, of companies and business to drop all kinds of money into the process in order to prevent certain developments from happening. The last time the act was amended was in, in, in 1952. Um, and there has been efforts to try to amend the act to make it stronger or more, more worker oriented. And all those efforts have been unsuccessful. The last effort being, being uh, AFCA, the, uh, the Employee Free, Free Choice Act. Um, during that time period, you had 60, 60 uh, Democratic members of, of the Senate. There was a choice that the administration had to make. Were they gonna go with, with EFCA right away or were they gonna go with Obamacare? And they opted for the latter. And the opportunity for EFCA to really become uh, the law of the country kind of disappeared almost indefinitely. Right. And now we hear conversations about the PRO Act. Uh, and, you know, in our, our prep discussions, we talked a little bit about secondary boycotts and punitive damages for employers. Um, you know, what are you are you excited about anything in the PRO Act or is there anything there that gives you, uh, you know, the thinking that people should be be excited about or be pushing for? Well, the, the thing that excites me most about the PRO Act is that it it seeks to do two principal things. One, it seeks to improve upon remedies. Uh, and, and, and remedies are woefully inadequate. Uh, for example, I could get terminated from my job because of my union activity. Um, I file a charge with the National Labor Relations Board. Meanwhile, I'm sitting out I'm not able to pay my mortgage or my kids' tuitions and, and, and the like. And uh, I may not even be el eligible for unemployment because the employer might say, well, he was terminated. So he, wa he wasn't el eligible for it. Um, I'm waiting for justice to get done. It takes 30 plus days for a case to get investigated. After the investigation, then, then the case is placed on the docket for litigation before an administrative law, a law judge. That, that's an appreciable period of time. The law judge's decision takes an appreciable period of time. That decision, if appealed to the board itself, then it sits at the board for a substantial period of time. And, and still, if the employer chooses not to uh, respond to the board's decision, that decision has to get enforced in federal, in federal court. We could conceivably talk about an issue that could last three to five years before it gets resolved. 
Meanwhile, what happens to me? What happens to my family? Um, and if and if by some chance there is political shenanigans going on, which is the kind of thing that I had to deal with while I was chairman, i.e., let's say no appointments have been made and you only got two or three board member, two, two board members functioning. And therefore, they, the NLRB can't even do its job because there is not a quorum to, to, to decide the case. And yet I have no route to the courts because I don't have an ind independent cause of action. Um, so I have that problem. And I have the fact that if I finally get a decision in my favor, all I'm going to get is my wages and whatever interest has accrued as a result. There is no, there's no punitive damages as a result. And the uh, real rub is that if there are any quarters during the time that I was out of work where I did not make a valiant search for work, that back pay for that period could be deducted from my back pay award. So an employer is being awarded for its bad, bad actions. So, you know, that, that the, uh, the PRO Act deals with that. that that's, that's a good thing. You, you, have, you have punitive damages and you have an, an, an independent right to action. It also deals with the fact that if, an employee has a right to strike, which is a statutory right. An employer cannot have a statutory or any kind of other right to permanent re permanently replace that employee because the current state of the law is you have a statutory right to strike as an employee, but uh, under interpretations of the law, not, not the statute itself, interpretations of the law that and an employer without even showing a need is presumed to have the right to permanently replace that employee. So that's, that's like saying um, uh, you have a right to cross the street, but a car has a right to run you down if you do. So that's not really a right, is it? Right, that's a really great example. <laughs> um, I have a question for one of our guests. I'm gonna ask you before I move on to the next question. Um, in the public sector, we have to deal with Janice versus AFSCME, which removed fair share dues payers. Uh, that, uh, that is a disadvantage to public sector workers. What can we do to address that under President Biden? Well, uh, I, under Pre President Biden, he's going to be constrained by the fact that this is a Supreme Court decision. Um, the, the, what, what, what the president can do though, is he can issue executive orders that demonstrate that the government recognizes the need for public sector unions. Um, President Obama did that. And in fact, President Kennedy at, at, at the very outset, what precipitated the growth of public sector unions was an executive order by President Kennedy's administration saying, we recognize that the public sector employees have a right to organize. And, and engage in union activity. Um, that was a message sent so that organizing can, can, can be enhanced. Uh, public sector unions, as I have learned from good, good friends and colleagues that are, that are in the public sector, are doing fairly well in dealing with the problem with Janice because they are organizing from within. They are, they are approaching their membership and the membership is learning that there is a value to being a member of the union and therefore they don't have a problem with pay, paying union dues. And quite frankly, the best organizer for public sector unions said, has been this current president because his conduct has been such that people feel that they need the protection. Absolutely. Um, and one of the conversations I have uh, with PWU leadership all the time is, you know, engagement is your best ally, right? Like, you know, if people actually know why they're paying dues and they want to pay dues because they know their union is, you know, they understand that they are the union and they also understand that union leadership being successful will make them successful. 
Um, I think that that's the generational message that's been lost, um, showing not just the business unionism, you know, I do something for you, you give me dues relationship, but the transformative relationship of organizing and understanding and building power. And I hear that thread through your answers. I really appreciate that. Um, you actually mentioned something I wanted to ask you about, which is executive orders. Um, can can uh, President uh, Biden, uh, President Biden, uh, make it easier to organize through executive orders? Uh, I know you know uh, Trump, President Trump made it. Uh, he really pushed the lines of executive power to a far reach. Could that same uh, elasticity be used to make it easier for workers to organize, um, whether in a union or workers who can't necessarily join a union? to do some of that organizing and be protected? Well, the first thing that, that uh, Trump did was eliminate a lot of uh, President Obama's executive orders with respect to labor relations. There, when I was heading an agency, there were labor relations committees established in the federal sector under executive order. And, and there was a requirement that these committees would be utilized and, and that organized labor would be engaged in, in that regard. All of those things had been had been eliminated with just with just the, the sweep of a pen. Um, that all can be put back and I understand that that uh, President-elect Biden has indicated that he was going to do uh, his best to reignite all of those executive orders as soon as he walks in the, in the door. With respect to the private sector, again, the, the president's ability to, to engage in uh, executive orders through, through uh, that affect the private sector are, are somewhat limited. I would venture to guess, however, I, well, I would query, however, whether or not uh, the the president can require uh, employers to post notices by by executive order. I know that the executive can and has done so through the Department of Labor required federal contractors to post notices in their facility advising their employees of those employees' rights under the National Labor Relations Act. And, uh, and that's as a condition of doing business with the federal, federal government. That, that, has, that, that can be reignited and, and any kind of connections with the federal government that businesses have, um, the president through executive order can influence. Excellent. And you know, that actually makes me think, um, you know, about the history of uh, exclusion of certain workers um, in the original legislation, right? Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times the reason we think about executive orders is because we think of existing labor law that can't necessarily be changed um, or it can't be changed very easily unless we have a Congress that's working together. Um, one of the subject areas that's come up a lot is the complex, his complex history between police and strike breakers, or police, uh, excuse me, police and unions, and then unions and strike breakers. Can you share some of your knowledge on the history um, in that context? Yes, but you know, you, you remind me, Larry, that that when I, when talking about executive orders, the executive order that comes most to mind with respect to people of color is one that was, was created based on the pressures that were put on uh, Roosevelt by A. Philip Randolph. A. R. Philip Randolph, who, I, who is my personal hero, by the way, and who I believe is the embodiment of the merger of workers' rights and civil rights. As many of you know, and, and forgive me for talking to the choir, A. Philip Randolph was the, the president of the largest black labor union in the country at the at, 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 at the at the time, the the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car, Car Porters. He was also a civil rights activist, activist. And during World War II, as you you all recall, Rosie the Riveters were were 
displayed all over the place about the the war effort and and doing doing what you can for the for the war effort. However, uh, people of color, black and and Asian and brown people were being denied opportunities in the, the defense industry. Well, A. Philip Randolph decided that, well, what he's going to do is take FDR on and say, guess what? We're going to have a march on Washington, a, a poor people's march on Washington. And FDR and everybody said, no, you can't do that. The violence that would ensue would be, would be devastating, et cetera. And A. Philip Randolph, was a good poker player because he was a union negotiator. He said, I'm doing it. And, and the, the concession he was able to get was an executive order pro prohibiting discrimination in the defense industry. And as a result, people of color were able to get defense industry jobs. And all of those Rosie the Riveter pictures in the background there were black rosies, there were yellow rosies, there were brown rosies. And so much so that me, my, my passion is art. I did a series of paintings. One you can see over, over, over this shoulder <laughs> is of uh, the series of, of, that I call the other rosies where it showed all of the diversity in the, in the war effort that we can credit uh, A. Philip Randolph from doing. Now, a. Philip Randolph didn't uh, didn't stop there. He had to deal with racism within within the unions practically his his entire career. Um, George Meany, who's celebrated as as the great union leader and the and the principal of the AFL CIO, uh, was in constant war with A. Philip Randolph because A. Philip Randolph was demanding that unions be sanctioned because of this, their racism and discriminatory policies. So much so that George Meany even, even sanctioned uh, uh, A. Philip Randolph during, during many of those, those feuds. Now, as, as I mentioned before, you know, sometimes history rhymes. Um, and now we have a situ situations with, with Black Lives Matters and, and George, George Floyd and, and, and police unions and the conflicts that, that ensue from that. It, it is a period of time where unions have to self-assess. Unions have to make a determination as to what it is that makes their being, what is at the core of their substance. And it can't be denied that people of color are a significant part of the union movement because the union movement could not survive without people of color. So there has to be a reckoning that, and there has to be a strong dialogue and there has to be a real serious look in the eye of those that are, uh, are detrimental to that cause. And it's going to have to start with, with voices, uh, facilities, institutionalized ability for uh, ethnic groups and, and uh, gender, different genders and different races to be able to have institutionalized voices within the union structure. It also was going to require that unions do it, their utmost to bring up more diversity within its leadership. Uh, we have so many situations that have come about where the scenario was such that had there been diversity in the situation, would there be the kind of atrocities that are, that, that are taking place? Heck, if the National Labor, excuse me, if the NFL has been able to see the light slowly, then unions can see the light as well. I just watched Monday Night Football last night uh, because my team, the Buffalo Bills, did okay. And during the course of the Monday Night Football, they started praising Colin Kaepernick like he was the greatest thing on earth. Isn't that funny? 
when when he was the one who took a knee and got ostracized by the NFL and it took a cop to put a knee on somebody's neck for everybody to get sensitized. No, you bring up some really interesting points here. Um, and I want to dig in on that just a little bit more. Uh, you know, one of the conversations I have been a part of in contract negotiations is the centering of impacted people, particularly black people, brown folks, indigenous folks, gay folks. And, you know, I come up in the union culture of, you know, that rising tide lifts all boats, but then, you know, seeing how in a contract, if you are not, you know, looking for specific issues and then trying to hone in on those problems, then it slips to the cracks and the employer takes advantage of that. Um, and I'll use an example, you know, pay, pay equality, pay equity. Um, we know that women of color are traditionally underpaid, are traditionally first fired and last hired. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily endemic in the union culture to maybe we talk about those things, but I don't see us necessarily negotiating on those things. Um, do you have any insight on, you know, what the labor movement can do to take the lead on some of these issues that are like big time issues that I think that they should be, you know, traditional media should be asking the labor movement what should happen in these moments, but they're instead they're going to kind of corporate executives and, you know, like, I don't, I don't want to ask Elon Musk about, you know, worker empowerment, if you know what I mean. Oh, well, well the unions and organized labor has such a major um, stake in this operation that, that their intent, attention has to be attention has to be given to them. And I think it happens when the door when you bang on the door hard. Uh, what happened when uh, when Trump was elected in 2016? In January of 27, you, 2017, you had an amazing rally of, of women, uh, that whole pussycat thing. And I, I was there with the, these women and their voice was strong and a lot of changes were made. The, the Me Too movement could change the game for a lot of corporations with respect to how how women are treated and, and the opp opportunities for advancement ha have taken place. It, it, the Me Too movement has put a chink in even uh, the EPIC system's ma mandatory arbitration where, where uh, that would require issues like discrimination, gender discrimination, to have to go to arbitration. There has been pushback on, on a grassroots scale, so much so that many corporations, including Google, have buckled under and have excluded uh, those kind of controversies from mandatory arbitration, the Gretchen Carl Carlson and so forth. Unions can take the forefront of this stuff and unions must do that so that when you have cases like continental foods where where a person a a striker is yelling obscene sexual comments towards a woman who who crossed the picket line the unions can snatch that person up and say this is not uh, the message that a union wants to present. This, the fact that this, this is a woman here has nothing to do with your issue. And if you dominate and you, you sexualize an issue, um, then you don't need to be part of this movement. Um, and, and, and look at the teachers. You had the teachers in West, West Virginia that, that went out on strike and the, the vast majority of them were, were women. Um, they, they raised the consciousness of, of the world in terms of what needs to be done in terms of, of equal, pay equity uh, because st students were not getting, getting a fair education because the teachers were not being fairly paid. The, the unions have that role. Unions have that responsibility. 
Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, so I want to circle back to that question of, uh, you know, the history of, you know, both police unions and, uh, you know, the complex history of, you know, strike breakers as they related to police, understanding that this is a long conversation that we would need far more than the 20 minutes, 10 minutes we have left to, to discuss this. Um, but contextually, when we talk about the word union with the average person, um, they're thinking of something, you know, outdated. They're thinking of something old school. They're not necessarily thinking of the many, many job classifications that are represented by unions. So, Yes, police, but also flight attendants, sanitation workers, on to you know some tech workers. I mean, there's there's all these industries that are being organized, like the nonprofit environmental movement. You know, um, there's so many different movements that have union representation. But for some reason, when people think of police, they think, and we have some police um, watching this video right now. So, is there something that you want people to understand about identity? Uh, when it comes to representation in law enforcement or just unionization in general uh, that you want folks to think about? Well, I, I guess I would first make a comment about, uh, about law enforcement and, and the genesis of the institution called the police department. That, in, that the relationship that the police department has with the black and brown and Asian community was that of conflict, was it, they were, a symbol of the oppression that that those uh, groups were were being subjected to uh, at the outset of history. Um, the, the and and this is not me uh, waxing poetic. Uh, Steve Greenhouse wrote a book recently uh, dealing with these kind of subjects, and it, it what is I found very interesting is that. In the South, the, the, the formalized police department previously were the slave catchers. And in the North, the police department, before they were organized into a form, formalized arm of a municipality, were, were the strike breakers. They, they, they uh, were stopping employees from, from organizing. So the relationship between them and the, 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 the public was that of we are the gatekeepers for the status quo and the status quo was business. Now, what happened, what happened over time is that, that uh, police uh, became employees of the municipalities and employees just like in any other situation have, have terms and conditions of employment that, that need and ought to be addressed or an appropriate so. And I, I think that po police unions have a, a value. The concern I, I have is that uh, where it merges into a culture where uh, oppression is the vehicle, it is a vehicle of, of oppression and that oppression is fortified by uh, processes that have been negotiated uh, to insulate people from justice, uh, from, from getting, uh, uh, account the, from accountability, that, that becomes a problem. Now, um, uh, can this be resolved? I think I think it can. I think I think that uh, police unions uh, uh, will have to be looked at in the context of how all unions should be looked at, and that is there are certain things that you cannot negotiate away. If I were in a manufacturing facility and I sat down with my employer and I wanted to negotiate a provision that says, if somebody steals or destroys your property, that person should not be disciplined for it. I'm not gonna get too far with that, with that provision. So there are certain aspects of 
the conduct of individuals that should not be able to be negotiated away. And that needs to be explored further. Wonderful. And something I want to make sure I ask you, you know, we're coming up on about five minutes left here. Um, one of the topics that kind of falls through the cracks when we talk about organized labor is workers who are considered contractors under the law, um, particularly, you know, drivers for Uber and Lyft, because those are, two, those are two biggest companies. But in Europe, we have Deliveroo. Recently in California, there was a Prop 22 that was really pushed by Uber and Lyft. A uh, very expensive campaign um, after progressive legislation had been passed to allow these employees to be considered employees and therefore be organizable into a union um, and have traditional benefits. Prop 22 was something that basically banned that um, and, and reversed a lot of that progress. Now, um, I think the way that I want to phrase this question to you is Does the, you know, at, that you know of at the level of the National Labor Relations Board, do they have an eye on these types of things? You know, are they watching this or is this typically outside of the purview of the board? Um, are they paying attention to these types of developments and you know, trying to look out for workers? I know that depends on administration. Um, and also, do you have any thoughts about that? Because I know a lot of you know, black led organizations and just traditional labor organizations were a bit confused about Prop 22 and then it ended up being you know, a loss for, for workers. Well, while I was while I was chair, we had a decision, uh, uh, the the FedEx decision, where we established a particular uh, set of criteria to determine uh, whether or not an, a person is an employee versus an independent contractor, and that case was immediately reversed by a Republican dominated board board in a case called Super Shuttle. Uh, after that, it was followed with uh, guidances that were issued by the general counsel with respect to, to uh, rideshare em employees. And clearly the board as it currently views the relationship, views rideshare employees uh, not to be independent contractors, not under the protection of the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, the problem, th as I see it, is that uh, businesses come about with these business models on a daily basis designed, quite frankly, to have their cake and eat it too i.e. mandate particular prescriptions with respect to how uh, a entity operates, but not have the bargaining obligation or the obligation to pay ne the necessary employee benefits. Um, employees, uh, well, the pushback on Proposition 22 by community groups and the uh, local NAACP chapters and the like stems from the fact that that we have the down, downtrodden, the poor, the immigrants, those folks that have a challenge in getting entry, entry le level protections. And one way of being able to get income is if you have a car and you have a driver's license and you, 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 you can do this work. Um, with with the with uh, the corporations dropping seventy million dollars into the yes campaign to stop uh, to get uh, proper pro proposition twenty two passed, what everybody thought was going on, all of the workers thought was going on, was that if we didn't vote yes on proposition uh, Proposition 22, that these businesses would stop providing ride, ride shares and this source of income would be gone. The downside is, and the fallacy of this whole thing is that, that these businesses are making too much of a profit. They would continue to operate. They would just have to in, adjust their structure so that they have to break off a little bit of their profits towards providing employees with benefits and, and, and protections. Um, the, the, the mis, this misguided uh, view of this has created a situation where workers of color face the disproportionate 
and racist barriers to stable employment, housing, education. And they're left with, with a situation where they think they're being independent of, tradi of traditional economy um, wage, wage uh, set, setups, but what they're doing is they've made, they're making themselves a permanent underclass by a situation that does not allow them to organize. They're, the operations are ruled by these algorithms that the employer claims is not of their doing, but is based on how these people are rated by the customers. If these, these uh, Uber drivers do not get lucrative routes and want to challenge the al algorithms, they're not being provided with that information because it's considered to be proprietary information. So how can you possibly see any kind of justice when it's stacked in that direction? And regrettably, this Prop Proposition 22 has been, been passed. And the my understanding is that in order for that to be overturned, you'd have to have a ridiculous majority in the state house in order for it to, to change. Wow, you've given us a lot to talk about and we, you know, um, we're out of time, but we have some really good questions in the, uh, in the question box here on the YouTube live. So I'm, I'm gonna make a suggestion. Um, why don't we collect some of those questions? And then uh, Mr. Pierce, if you'd like to respond in writing, um, we can share them both on our email list and also on Union Base. Would you be willing to do that? I'd be glad to, sure. Excellent. And let me just say that that really shows that people are really excited uh, to have this interaction. And you know, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you now, uh, you don't have to answer me now, but we'd love to have uh, more of you in 2021 hear from the Workers' Rights Institute and see how we can work together to make sure workers know about their rights and that the labor movement is fully ready to take on the challenges that it's gonna face uh, in the Biden era and beyond. I'm ready, willing, and excited to continue the discussion. Wonderful, thank you, Mr. Pearson. Thank you everyone for joining us. Also, all those unions that we named, again, can't thank you enough for all the support that you give us doing this work. Um, we're gonna be having some really exciting discussions coming up and hopefully some interesting surprise guests coming up in early 2021. Um, so stay tuned and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Pierce.